Please join me in the prayer of illumination found in your bulletin. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with transforming joy what you say to us today. Amen. I'll be reading a little bit different scripture than it's posted in the bulletin. I'll be reading Luke 1, 30 through 37, and also Matthew 18, 1 through 4. As soon as I find it. All right, this is Luke 1. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for God has decided to wonderfully bless you. Very soon now you will become pregnant and have a baby boy and you are to name him Jesus. He shall be very great and shall be called the Son of God. And the Lord God shall give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he shall reign over Israel forever. His kingdom shall never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can I have a baby? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you and the Spirit of God shall overshadow you. So the baby born to you will be utterly holy the Son of God. Furthermore, six months ago, your Aunt Elizabeth, the barren one, they called her, became pregnant in her own age. For every promise from God shall surely come true. Matthew 18, 1 through 4. About that time, the disciples came to Jesus to ask which of them would be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus called a small child over to him and set the little fella down among them and said, Unless you turn to God from your sins and become as little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, anyone who humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. I decided yesterday that it was much easier for her to change scriptures than for me to have to write a whole sermon based on scarlet scripture. <laughs> Plus, that allows her to use the sermon that she has this week another week if she wants to. Let us pray. Father Mary was told nothing is impossible with you, Lord. And the listener was chastened to become like a child. Lord, speak to us this day so that we might also believe, share, and live your word. Amen. Amen. Raise your hand if you're ready for Christmas. All right. Very good. Some of you probably do have all of your shopping done, most of your baking, at least some of the packages wrapped. Bravo, and my hat is off to you because I've got a little shopping done. I've got a little baking done, but nothing's wrapped. But let me ask, I know that there are even more of you out there that just can't wait for Christmas. <laughs> Raise your hand if you just can't wait for Christmas. Yay. Yes, yes, it's an exciting time of year. It's a time of hoping and wishing and dreaming about that special day. And I know that some of you are so excited. but I would be willing to guess that there are more than a few of you out there who cannot wait for Christmas to be over. For some, there are too many memories that hurt, searing deep into our hearts. There's too many disappointments too many unfulfilled dreams. And for some, it's the stress that comes with these tough economic times that have brought upon us just really, really 
it's, it's really tough to get excited right now. You feel you're going to disappoint someone who's counting on you. You feel like you're not going to live up to the expectations that someone else or that you have put upon yourself. There's a lot of pressure to do Christmas right, whatever that means. I'm very afraid that the commercialism has put that expectation upon us. I think too many of us have become such a calloused people that we don't have the time, the energy, or the willingness to share the best news that ever was? Could it be that we have forgotten what it feels like to feel the magic of Christmas? Think back for a little while. Think back to a time when you were a little little, little child, when nothing was impossible. Do you remember when you blew out the candles on your birthday cake and you were positive that your wish would come true? I still make a wish when I blow out the candles on my birthday cake. Do you remember when you were a child and your mother and your father told you that if you put your mind to it, you could be anything in the world that you wanted to, even the President of the United States? And you never doubted for a moment that that wasn't true. I remember, and I bet my dad doesn't remember, but I, I can remember when I was a little bitty kid, about five years old, and in those days you didn't have to wear seat belts, and you were, you were, we sat in the back seat, but you know we kind of hung over the front. And I can remember, I was growing up in Monmouth, Illinois. It's a little tiny town. Um, there might have been five stoplights, but I doubt there were even that many. But anyway, every time we would come to a red light, I would say, Daddy, blow out that red light and make it turn green. And now I can sort of see the gleam in his eye. Uh, then I'm sure I didn't notice it, but, but he would smile. And then just at the right time, he would go, and the light turned green. <laughs> My dad was magic. He could do it. I believed it. I believed it. And do you remember on Christmas morning running down the stairs to see your stocking and see what was underneath the Christmas tree? Do you remember? Christmas time was truly a magic time when I, when I was a kid. My bedroom faced south, and the winter moonlight would kind of stream through the, through the uh, trees, the barren trees, and kind of make kind of scary shadows on the, on the wall. But, you know, at Christmas time, it was just magical. And a few blocks away, there was a factory that had a big tall tower, and every Christmas, they put a star on the top of it. And I would lay in bed at night and just imagine that was the star of Bethlehem and the wise men coming. I, I never, until last night when I was working on I never realized that I was thinking of the wise men coming to the dog food factory. <laughs> <laughs> but I was a little kid and, and, and it was a magical time and, and there was a star there and I imagined that that was the star of Bethlehem. And, and on Christmas Eve, after we had been to church, after we had been allowed to open up one package, someone in the family would have read the Christmas story and twas the night before Christmas, and we'd headed up to bed to that impossible night when we can't sleep. But I would lay there in bed, and after a while, I heard the bells on Santa's sleigh. I knew I heard those bells. And, and usually it, it was when it had snowed a lot, but I could hear the thump when the sleigh landed on the roof. And even though we didn't have a fireplace, I knew that Santa would have absolutely no trouble getting 
in our locked doors because nothing was impossible when I was a kid. We didn't have a lot of gifts at Christmas time. I knew that my friends had way more clothes and they had way more toys than I had, but that didn't seem to matter because the magical time of getting together with family and friends and, and sharing that gift that you had bought at Woolworths, the, the corsage or the, or the little bottle of perfume or, or whatever it was that was at the dime store, we knew they were going to love whatever it was. What's happened to that innocence? We don't live in those times anymore. The radios blare Christmas music 24-7 from before Thanksgiving. I love Christmas music. I just don't like it 24-7. And, and the stores have asked us to buy, buy, buy since before Halloween. Childlike innocence has faded. For some children, they had to grow up way, way too fast, more, more than any child should ever have to. And for some, they choose to live grown-up lives thinking it's way cooler than living the life of a young person. It's no longer the wonder and the magic of Christmas. It's the wonder and magic of give me, give me, give me, and how much are we going to spend to boost the country's economy. Jesus said, unless you become like a little child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. I know I've told you this story before, but I think it bears repeating. <clears throat> A mom and a dad had a three-year-old little girl, and, and she just had had a new baby brother, and she wanted to spend some time with that baby brother. And her parents, you know, wanted her to, to, to bond with this child, but were a little bit hesitant to, to let her spend any time alone. But eventually, they, they kind of gave in, and they had the monitor on anyway, so... So the little girl went into the bedroom and she closed the door because she wanted to have a private conversation with her little brother. And she went over and she peeked over the crib and she said, baby, baby, tell me about God. I think I'm forgetting. Tell me about God. I think I'm forgetting. We live in a world that is desperate to hear the word of God. Desperate to know this Savior. They're crying out, tell me about Another story in the upper room a few years ago told about a, a little girl about five years old who, who was talking to her grandfather one day, and she says, Grandpa, you know what? Whenever I go to the bathroom, I pray to Jesus. And Grandpa kind of thought about it and said, Well, do I ask? <laughs> but he did, and he said, Well, why do you do that? And she said, Well, Grandpa, one day I went in there and there was a great big old bug on the floor and I was afraid. And, and you told me that whenever I was afraid, I should pray to Jesus. So I did. And that bug didn't hurt me, so every time I go into the bathroom, I pray to Jesus. <laughs> it's a good plan. And she said, and I also pray to Jesus when I cross the road. Another good plan. And we chuckle and all, but... That's the childlike innocence. That's the sincere and simple truth and faith that a child has to believe that God can do anything. Here we are, mature, fairly intelligent Christians. 
Is our faith is our faith such that we can trust and believe that our God can do anything? The faith of a child. Unless you become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus expects us to be like little children. He expects and he wants us to have complete trust in him. Kids can teach us a lot about faith and trust. And they can teach us how to celebrate Christmas. Try spending some time as with children as they go down the toy aisle or as they look in the catalogs and, and I know they say, I want, I want, give me, give me, give me. But, but this is a child. It's a child who has that trust and that assurance that anything is possible. I don't want you to be smug and think, they'll find out soon enough. They're just living in rose-colored glasses. No. No, they are looking at life as a child. They are looking at, a li at life as a precious child of God. And with God, all things are possible. When my children were young, we always used to set up the nativity on the floor underneath the Christmas tree, and the, the boughs of the Christmas tree kind of formed a canopy over it. And when Andrew was, was young, we had a, a fairly large ceramic set once when we had company over, Andrew was playing with the nativity set like, like he always did. And, and my friend said, um, aren't you afraid he's going to break it? And I, I said, well, I hadn't really thought about it. And, and then she said something about maybe it was a little bit sacrilegious for him to be playing with all of these holy figures. And I said, just watch him for a little while. And Andrew, Andrew had the shepherds up on the sofa because they were on hillside. And, and, and he had the angel come, and the angel came down and said, go, go, go see the baby Jesus. And then he had the, king, the camels, and the camels kind of galloped over, you know, because they were riding on camels, and, you know, camels don't walk so smoothly and majestically. He was having them ride over. Andrew was playing and acting out with, with the nativity what he did with his action figures every day when he played. It was an interactive story for him. And my friends, Christmas is an interactive story. And it's a never-ending story where each year we have the opportunity to give a piece of ourselves to others just like God did when he gave us Jesus. I know, I do know, that we are often hardened by life's disappointments. We've all either said or heard someone say, nothing surprises me anymore. But there are joyful surprises every day every day when we look for them. Think about a little baby. Think about a little baby who has, who's trying ice cream for the first time. And they put that cold ice cream on their lips and they get such a wide, surprised look on their face. Or think back to, to when you were a teenager and you had your first kiss. Whether it was sweet or sloppy, <laughs> most probably awkward, what a delightful surprise it was. And then sometimes there's just very simple surprises 
when you're greeted with a smile or a hug, maybe a phone call that was all unexpected. And Christmas, too. Imagine how surprised Mary and Joseph were when they were told by the angel that they were going to have a very, very special baby. And remember the shepherds out on that cold, wintry night, and all of a sudden, a whole host of angels came and said, for you, a new baby has been born. For you, a king has come, and we want you to go see it. Imagine the wise men seeking out the king of kings, and they found out that this child had been born in a cave where animals are kept? Even though you've heard the story a gazillion times, Christmas does not have to lose its surprise and its magic. God sent Jesus into the world because he loves each and every one of you so much, more than we could possibly imagine or understand. And that one man has changed this world forever. The angel told Mary, nothing is impossible with God. If we expect the impossible, this Christmas and every Christmas will be filled with wonderful surprises but also with the wonderful opportunity to tell others who are desperate to hear it about our God. I want to share with you another one of Ann Weems' poems. I shared one in the newsletter, but, and I do have it on my desk because I love, I love to read her poems. And this one she says, not celebrate, not celebrate? You say your burden is too great to bear. You say your loneliness is too intensified during this Christmas season. Your tears seem to have no end. But not celebrate? You should lead the celebration. You should run through the streets to ring the bells and sing the loudest. You should fling tinsel on the tree and open your house to your neighbors and call them to dance. For it is unto you and your loved ones. It is unto you that the Savior is born this day. The one who comes to lift your burden from your shoulders. The one who comes to wipe the tears from your eyes. You are not alone. For he is born this day to you. I ask again, are you ready for Christmas? Look beyond the cards and the shopping and the baking and the parties. It's Jesus we're preparing for. It's his birth we're celebrating. Let's enjoy it like a child. Scream from the top of your lungs. It's Christmas. Let's celebrate the birth of our Savior. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.